Thank you for joining us on our webinar today, where we will discuss our toolkit, Get Out the Count, Strategies for Optimizing 2020 Census Participation Among Older People. My name is Ilana Keeper, and I am joined by my colleague, Alyssa Kies, and we both work at the New York Academy of Medicine. At the New York Academy of Medicine, our mission is to drive progress towards health equity. We do this through three main mechanisms. Our fellows program is a network of over 2,000 experts across the medical, public health, and social work professions. We have a world-class medical history library, and we have a research evaluation and policy program. Within that, Alyssa and I are part of the Healthy Aging Department. On this project, we are partnering with Live On New York. You can read about what they do here, and as a membership organization, they represent over 100 agencies that serve older adults throughout New York, and they are working with us to disseminate this toolkit among their members and other organizations that can benefit from census participation among older adults. So on this webinar today, we have a number of things we want to convey to you. Uh, we want to tell you about why we created this toolkit and why we think it's important. We want to give you some basic facts about how the 2020 census works. And then we want to show you how you can identify hard to count older adults within the communities that you work with so you know how to target your outreach. And then finally, we're going to give you some best practices to create those outreach plans and engagement strategies for census participation. Our goal is that after listening to this webinar, you yourself will complete the census and you will work with the organization that you work with on some type of census outreach plan. So why did we even create the 2020 Census Toolkit? There are really three main reasons that you can see up here. The data that goes into the census every 10 years determines the funding on a federal, state, and local level that affects older New Yorkers as well as everyone that lives in New York and everyone in the United States. Number two, there are many older New Yorkers that are considered hard to count. And hard to count means groups or populations who have historically been undercounted and or have not responded well to the decennial census, such as ethnic populations, people who rent, and low-income households. And finally, you are the professional who works with older adults, and you have a huge hand in being able to positively impact their census participation. So how did we actually create this toolkit? We first conducted a literature review on existing research related to census participation and older adults. We then had interviews with experts at 20 different organizations, and we also attended a number of city and state convenings on census education and outreach. And we wanna give a huge thank you to the Samuel Foundation for their generous support of this entire initiative. Here is just a list of the 20 organizations that we interviewed with. We wanna thank everyone um, who gave up their time and their expertise on this project. So now let's talk about the 2020 census. Um, so we all know that the census um, is really going to be able to capture the increasingly diverse and growing population of the United States. And that actually really relates to older adults who, as we know, are growing at an unprecedented rate in the country. The goal of the census is to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. And this is quite a challenge, considering that we have approximately 330 million people in the US who live in 140 million housing units. But we will do this because it is mandated by the Constitution, and we do it every 10 years, and we have been since 1790. The importance of the census and how it dictates what we how it dictates how the government really runs is that it will it will actually determine over six hundred and seventy five billion dollars every year in federal funding. In addition, it will also determine uh, how many representatives each state has in the in the house. So those are the two main reasons why it is so important for everyone to be counted in the upcoming census. So when will you hear about the census? Uh, coming up in the middle of March, every household will be receiving an invitation in the mail to complete the census online. 
the, then the Census Bureau will keep on sending you mailings until you have completed the census. But you can see here by like the middle of April, if you have not completed the census online, you will then receive a paper questionnaire of the census to encourage you to fill it out by paper and mail it back. And then if you still have not completed the census, um, then census workers will come knock on your door to actually have you fill out the census in person. And then by the end of December, uh, the Census Bureau will tabulate all of the data and release the results uh, by state of what the census shows us. And I just want to note um, that only one census form needs to be filled out per household. And a household is defined as any person or number of people who live in the same housing unit. The census will be available in 13 different languages. You can see the list here. These 13 languages cover 99% of the languages spoken in U.S. households. So many people might be concerned about giving their uh, personal information to any type of government entity or agency. And the census form does ask for names, addresses, and phone numbers. But we want to make it very clear that your information is safe. The Census Bureau takes this very seriously and is doing everything in its power to make sure the information is not only is confidential, is safe, and is not going anywhere. So basically, the information is going into the Census Bureau, and the Census Bureau is only going to produce that information in the aggregate and in statistics. So you're, I just again want to just reiterate that the information is safe and it is only used by the Census Bureau specifically to produce those statistics. And Census Bureau employees take this very seriously. There are serious uh, punishments if they do not, and, um, and your information is safe. So the Census Bureau has a separate group quarters enumeration process for people living in certain types of housing facilities such as skilled nursing facilities or things places like college dormitories. Administrators of these facilities will work directly with the Census Bureau to count these residents. Anyone who lives in independent or assisted living and has their own mailing address will be sent an invitation to respond to the census individually. They will not be counted in the group quarters enumeration process. People who are in a hospital on April 1st will be counted at the residence where they live and sleep most of the time once they have been discharged. For more detailed information about this and about all of the specific 2020 census forms and process, please go to 2020census.gov. So now that you are all experts in the upcoming census, we are going to provide you with some strategies to share this knowledge with the older adults that you work with. So older adults are considered hard to count in this upcoming census because this is the first time that the census will be uh, able to be completed online. There are also a host of intersecting traits and demographics among older New Yorkers that might make them unlikely to complete the census for a variety of reasons. And you can see some of those demographics, although this is not a comprehensive list, um, up here on the screen. Note that many of these tra traits may intersect with the fear or mistrust of the government, and that may inhibit people from providing information to a government agency. So we just ask that you keep all of this in mind as you are targeting your outreach, but most importantly, our collective goal is that every older New Yorker is counted. So in order to identify hard to count older adults, you can use the New York Academy of Medicine's mapping tool, which is called Image NYC the interactive map of aging. Image NYC was debuted in January 2018, and it was created in partnership with the CUNY Mapping Service at CUNY's Graduate Center, with support from the Samuels Foundation, as well as SJC, a foundation of philanthropic funds. The screenshot here shows you the 2010 census self-response rates by census tract in New York City. The self-response rate is the percentage of households that mailed back a completed census form in 2010. And a census tract is a geographic area of approximately 4,000 people. The neighborhoods that are used in Image NYC are made up of multiple census tracts. 
So the map you're looking at here shows the New York City census tracts indicated by yellow, orange, and red, where fewer than 73% of households mailed back their census forms in 2010. The darkest shade of red indicates that fewer than 60% of households in that census tract mailed back their forms in 2010. So this image map helps us focus our census outreach in neighborhoods that have historically not completed the census. Uh, there was also data on Image NYC that showed access to computers and the internet related to older adults as well as demographic information on hard to count populations such as people born outside of the US, people with limited English proficiency, and people with low incomes, all for adults 65 and older. So now we're looking at another part of the map where we've kind of zeroed in on the southwest section of the Bronx, um, and this is neighborhoods like Melrose and Mott Haven. So we're actually looking at a different demographic area, I'm sorry, different demographic data point, and you can tell by the dark green, which indicates um, that over 90% of the population in this part of the Bronx speaks Spanish and speaks English less than very well. So this tells us that this is likely going to be a hard to count area. But we have all of these resources listed here that can help you with your census outreach and or be partners in your census activities. So we have, you can see here, hospitals and FQHCs, senior centers, libraries, farmers markets. These are all places that older adults tend to congregate and, and there are many different ways that you can work with these uh, organizations and resources in your census work. And for anyone that has not used Image NYC before, we wanna point out that you can obtain a wide range of information about services, resources, and demographics. So we actually completed a user feedback process, which informed an update to the image website, and we now have additional data sets, user-friendly tutorials, and a crosshatch pattern that compares two demographics. For instance, uh, neighborhoods like Mott Haven, what we were just looking at before, and Hunts Point in the southwest part of the Bronx, have over 70% of adults 65 and older with an income of less than $25,000. And you can see that in the legend right there in the middle of the screen. But the cross hatching, which are the uh, kind of gray marks on the map, show us that only 50% of the households are receiving SNAP benefits. So this shows us, you can see in the area circles, that there are probably about 20% of very low income older adults that are not receiving SNAP that are eligible to. So this is just one of many examples of how Image NYC can inform your work. Um, and anyone that is not working in New York City, we are still happy to speak with you about how you can adapt this type of map to the city or county where you live. And you can see my contact information over there if you would like to learn more. So there are two other maps we're going to briefly touch upon that can also help you. The 2020 Heart to Count map was also developed by the CUNY Mapping Service, and this map provides information, again, on 2010 census self-response rates, as well as internet access and other at-risk factors for people of all ages. Um, and that's divided all in census tract, in a census tract. Um, certain data points, as I mentioned, from this map have now been added to the Image NYC map, and you can see the website right over there on how to access this map. Another feature on this 2020 hard to count map will be the ability to see in real time the response rate of the 2020 census. So you'll be able to see that the Census Bureau will be posting this information, which will then be transferred to this particular map. Uh, and I just want to note that it will be tracking self response rates, but it will not be tracking the actual data information that is going on to the census form. So this can actually, this will be a really useful tool if you're seeing that particular census tracts in neighborhoods that you work with as time goes on between March and July have low response rates that will help you figure out where to really focus your outreach. All right, and the final map we want to tell you about is the map that the Census Bureau uh, manages, which is called Rome Response Area Outreach Mapper. 
So this mapping tool can help you identify hard to count areas. And what's unique about this map is that it includes a low response score. And that is the prediction of the percentage of people in a census tract that will likely not respond to the 2020 census. This is based both on 2010 census response data, as well as an algorithm of response rates to other surveys, such as the annual American Community Survey. So you're looking here at the map of the country, and you can see all of the census tracts. The lighter colors, such as yellow, mean that there will likely be a higher self-response rate to the 2020 census. And the darker colors, such as purple and blue, show a lower likely self-response rate. So we have kind of zeroed in here, you can see on the right-hand side, in Census Tract 168 in New York City, which is where our office at NIME is in East Harlem. And the row map shows us that almost 33% of the population in this census tract is expected not to self-respond to the 2020 census. And that means that this census tract is considered hard to count. So after using these mapping tools to locate hard to count populations, the next step is to develop an outreach strategy. And Alyssa will now tell you exactly how to do that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ilana, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alyssa Kiev, and I'm a policy associate at the New York Academy of Medicine. So I'll be discussing how to develop your census outreach strategy after you've identified who the hard to count older adults are in your constituency and where they're located using the mapping tools that Ilana's just described. So many of you are already trusted and effective messengers among your clients and within your community, but now the goal is to become an effective messenger of the census. So what this means is knowing key dates like the first and last day to take the census, uh, knowing how to define a household, which means everyone who is living in a housing unit at the time of completion. Um, I know some of you work with people who live in complex households or transitional living arrangements, so be able to answer questions about this. And then know about the different methods of taking the census. We know that this year the census will be available online, but it is not only available online. You can still take the census by phone, on paper, or in person when a census worker comes to your house uh, to enumerate you in person. So as uh, you're developing your outreach strategy, you really want to anticipate some of the questions that your specific clients or constituents in particular may have. Um, and in addition, we strongly advise you to take the census yourself as early as possible. By doing so, you'll be, you'll be able to more easily explain how simple it is to take the census and to answer questions about it. Um, one easy way to educate your colleagues about what you've learned during this webinar is forwarding the link to them or by downloading our full toolkit and forwarding it to the people in your network. And so I want to direct uh, your attention to the graphic at the, at the bottom of this slide. So in 2010 in New York City, the self-response rate for all households was only 62%. And so what, what this means is that 62% of people mailed back their forms without a census worker coming to their door to enumerate them. This number is significantly lower than the national average. So if we want to get proper representation and funding, we need a mass mobilization effort to get all households to participate. So when encouraging census participation, it's important to emphasize the positive outcomes. The two big benefits that Ilana mentioned earlier are congressional representation and resource allocation. So the census determines how $675 billion of federal funding will be distributed annually to many programs that improve the quality of life for older adults and their families. It also determines how many representatives each state has in the House of Representatives and the Electoral College. It's important to make these benefits feel as tangible and relevant as possible when you're having a conversation with somebody about the census so have some concrete examples on hand to illustrate your point. For example, 
census data determines how $70 billion in Medicare funding is distributed. And although we're talking about older adults, we know that they're not only concerned with programs that affect them because of their age. So you can mention that, for example, programs like WIC or Pell Grants or the National School Lunch Program or the National Highway Planning Construction Program, all of these are funded based on census data. Um, we know that federal funding already does not provide adequate funding for many of these programs. But the sad irony is that the Medicare population, for example, that is already underserved and is already less likely to take the census, if they don't take the census this year, they'll receive even less. Um, census data are also used outside of allocating federal funding. Sometimes it's hard to find yourself within $675 billion, so make it tangible, make it relevant. Planners and policymakers use census data to improve public transit, like deciding where to locate new bus routes or new bus shelters, uh, where to locate new libraries, senior centers, hospitals, and where to deploy emergency response services in case of a catastrophe. So these are all examples that you can share with people when you're talking to them about the census. As an example, of how census response rates relate to local amenities and resources, we used the Image NYC map to find a census tract in East Williamsburg that had a high self-response rate to the census and a high number of resources. So what we're looking at now is this light blue shaded uh, census tract in the middle of this image that's surrounded by red, orange, and yellow shadings. So in this neighborhood, 58% of households headed by someone over 65 have an income lower than $25,000 per year. And 38% of the households uh, headed by adults over 65 um, are headed by someone who's foreign born. So it's not necessarily a neighborhood that you would expect to be highly resourced or to have a particularly high self-response rate to the census. But in this case, it does. And the high self-response rate correlates to a high number of amenities. So what we're looking at here are icons that indicate bus shelters, senior centers, public pools, benches, libraries. And we see a lot more of those icons in this light blue shaded area than we do in the red, orange, and yellow shaded areas that, you know, a few of them have benches or subway entrances. But other than that, there's not that much. So. This is all to say, you can use examples beyond just federal funding allocation to make powerful arguments for completing the census. Um, we know that this year some people will be scared to fill out the census. Um, I don't want to tiptoe around it because as a trusted messenger, you need to be prepared to address those concerns when they arise. So in general, the stakeholders we interviewed who work with immigrant communities suggested not to bring up the citizenship question unless asked. Uh, we know that there was a lot of conversation this year about a citizenship question being on the 2020 census, but to be clear, there will be no citizenship question on the 2020 census. And furthermore, census responses are never shared with ICE, with the Department of Homeland Security, with landlords, with uh, local police departments. Census data go in the US Census Bureau and it comes out as statistics only. Um, finally, in our stakeholder interviews, we received the feedback that one message that resonates with a lot of older adults is that if you take the census early and self-respond, then you can avoid a Census Bureau worker coming and knocking on your door. So in general, it's best to emphasize the positive outcomes of census participation and just be prepared to address fears and myths about the census as they arise. Um, you really don't want to direct unnecessary attention to fears about the census. Just be prepared to have an answer when people ask you about it. Um, we also know that disinformation will be spreading uh, about the census this year, including on social media as well as private networks like WhatsApp or other text messaging platforms. So what we're looking at here um, is two images that were created to spread false information about the census. Um, the image on the far left is a fake ACLU graphic in Spanish that reads, uh, if you receive a census form, don't fill it out, ICE will find you and deport you. And uh, in the center is a uh, kind of 
viral chain text message that was spreading via WhatsApp. Uh, we know that older adults can be more vulnerable to scams and fraud. So if one of your clients brings a concern like this to you, uh, brings a concern like this to you, be prepared to spot disinformation and then to share correct information about the census. So you'll want to be able to share how census information is collected, uh, including what type of information um, as well as what type of information is not collected. So a, a census form or a census worker will never ask you for your social security number, your bank information. They will never ask you for any type of money or donation. Um, et cetera. So as a trusted messenger, it's important to be able to counteract false information. The final step in planning your outreach strategy is to develop an approach that resonates with your audience. Uh, one of the best ways to do that is to involve them in the planning process and to have them become effective census advocates as well. Uh, we really encourage you to think outside the box when it comes to doing outreach. For example, we know that senior centers are a common place that we like to do outreach to older adults, um, but we also know that's only a small subset of the population. So where do the people that you serve congregate? Is it a place of worship? Is it the park in the spring to play chess or take an exercise class? Is it the local diner where everyone goes to get their coffee in the morning? So think about your specific audience and ask yourself these questions as you're developing your outreach plan. We have a series of questions here that can help guide um, the development of your outreach approach. During our stakeholder interview process, the experts we interviewed shared a wide variety of potential messengers who can be effective census advocates. Um, those people included more obvious messengers like medical professionals, faith-based leaders, and local, uh, local elected officials, but also included adult children, tenant association leaders, pharmacists, barbers, hairdressers, uh, paid caregivers, meal delivery personnel. Um, so think about uh, kind of non-traditional messengers as you're developing your outreach approach. So it's, it's not enough to just be motivated to take the census. Um, people also need to have the capacity to take the census. So the next step in conducting a census outreach uh, process is to develop a tactical strategy to actually facilitate the completion of the census. So for example, we know that two areas that people may need help with are language assistance and accessibility for people with disabilities. So to help with that, you can have staff on site who are knowledgeable about the census and can provide assistance. Uh, you can provide resources like language guides, uh, braille guides, large print guides. The Census Bureau provides these on their website. Um, or if nothing else, you want to know where to find local resources and be able to quickly direct people to them. Um, the public library system is a great example of this, which I'll talk about more in the next slide. So, um, as we know, this year the census will primarily be online. Um, so, if you have the resources, we really encourage you to make computers or Wi Fi available and to have staff on site to help people fill out the census. You can fill out the census on the web browser uh, on your computer or on your phone. So, if you don't have the resources to provide computers, um, there are other organizations that do. We like to point out the library system specifically. So uh, this year at the New York, Brooklyn, and Queens Public Libraries, anyone can go in and use a computer to complete the census. No library card is required. Um, and certain branches will serve as census hubs and have signage and have staff on site to help people fill out the census. Um, so, as aging service professionals and as people who work with older adults, you already have communication and engagement channels for reaching older adults. You don't have to reinvent the wheel here. You can use those channels for pushing out census messaging. Use your mailings, your newsletters, your emails, your events, and your conversations on a daily basis to make announcements about the census. Um, ensure that your staff who work directly with older adults are effective census messengers, um, especially if you have homebound clients. You'll want people who deliver their meals or the people who contact them by phone to be promoting the census. April 1st, 
2020 is Census Day, which is a big day event of events across the nation that are all dedicated to promoting the census. It's not the first day or the last day to take the census. It's just a big day of coordinated census activities. Uh, this year, that day is a Wednesday. So if you have a regular event on a Wednesday, make it a census themed event. Um, we will be doing our own census day event on April 1st, so keep your eye out for that. Um, just to conclude, doing your census outreach does not have to be an expensive or time consuming process. It can really be built into the things that you're already doing. All right, so the next steps for all of us are to attend a training with Live On New York. Uh, if you'd like to do that, you can bring this training to your organization by reaching out to Stephanie Ruiz, whose contact information is listed here, and who will be organizing in-person trainings over the next few months. We encourage you to download the full toolkit, which you can access at niamorg slash publications. And then we really want you to organize a staff meeting on census outreach to kick off your uh, outreach plan. Finally, when you get the mailer in March, fill out the census. Um, our contact information is listed here. So if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to us via email, and we really thank you for joining. This is a super important opportunity for all of us to ensure that everyone is counted and we all get our fair share of resources and services. Thank you so much for joining, and uh, please reach out to us with any other questions. <laughs>